Hey, it's Jason again from Fraser Valley Rose Farm, here to continue my series on the Old Garden Roses, continuing on to the Elbas. Now, I have to say, I'm a little biased here, I love the Elbas, and if you wanted to choose to start with one group of the Old Garden Roses to put in your garden, I think the Elbas would not be a bad choice. Immensely garden worthy. And I'm going to start this video a little differently. I'd like to start with a slideshow of the plants. Alright, I hope you enjoyed that slideshow of the Elbas. I'm going to get into the descriptions here, but before I do, it might be a good time to go to the bottom of the screen here and click the CC, or closed captioning symbol. That way, as I try to go through French or Latin names and I butcher the pronunciation, you won't have to rely on my words. I'll go through the transcript shortly after uploading and make sure that those are spelled properly in the transcript. Okay, let's start with this. The Elbas are a smaller group than the Gallicas and the Damasks. And what I mean by that is there are fewer extant varieties, ones that I can find today on the market. I'm not sure there were ever as many Albas as there were Gallicas or Damasks. And I'm not sure quite why that is. Because they're such an excellent garden rose, the only thing I can think of, or my personal theory, is maybe just that the color range of the Albas was a little less popular than the darker, richer colors of the Gallicas. Uh, the Albas are pretty much limited to white and light pink, uh, almost by definition. And so the Gallicas would have had fancy spotting, mottling, uh, stripes, and darker pink and towards purple colors. So that may be the reason, although I may be full of it as well. Okay, now let's start with a description of how they grow. The Albas are a tall, arching shrub, even more so than the Damasks. Uh, gracefully arching branches and, as I say, quite tall. They have a big garden presence. Uh, their flower color is that white and pink that I mentioned and showed in the slideshow there, and uh, with an excellent scent on the flowers. They do bloom only in the spring, and they do bloom over a long period, so it may take them from anywhere in the range of three weeks or a little bit longer to go from the first bloom all the way to the last bloom on the shrub. So it's a long period, but it's only once in the year. Uh, what else? They characteristically have a foliage that's kind of got a grayish or bluish tinge to it. And early on, I think people made the assumption possibly that these were related to Rosa rubrifolia. Uh, genetic testings more recently has found that they are probably closer related or a hybrid between the Gallica and the Dog Rose, uh, Rosa canina. Uh, one more thing I'll mention is just to do with their overall health. And I've mentioned before that uh, the Gallicas are a little susceptible to foliar disease. The Albas, not so much. I've had good luck with them in my garden and they have a good reputation, good solid reputation for being very disease resistant and also exceptionally cold hardy. So if you're in those uh, American prairies where you can't grow all of the new hybrid roses, uh, the Albas might be a good choice for you. All right, I'm not gonna go too far into history or folklore of roses in this video. I did plenty of that in the Gallica video, but I do have to cover the War of the Roses. So here goes. The War of the Roses was fought in England from about 1455 for 30 years between the supporters of the House of York and the House of Lancaster. And you guessed it, the House of Lancaster had a rose that bore its name, and so did the House of York. The White Rose of York was reputed to be Rosa Alba Semiplana, as shown in this video, and the Red Rose of Lancaster was taken to be the Rosa Gallica officinalis, which I showed in my last video. And as is uh, dramatically portrayed in this scene uh, that I'm putting up on the screen, it, 
it's a like the story goes that the nobles had to choose between two garden roses the white or the red to show their support for these two houses that may have been a little bit uh, made up after the fact but uh, certainly is an interesting piece of rose history when the rose when the war came to an end by the way with a bit of a york victory the uh, the two roses were combined into one floral emblem the tudor rose so that's how the War of the Roses fits into History of Roses. From the front end of this video, I showed that slideshow of the different varieties. I actually had a couple of notes about those roses. So Chloris is one of my garden favorites. It's a soft pink with an excellent scent, a tall, graceful habit, and my favorite part, completely free of thorns. I also should note that I have some gardening friends who have grown this way up in the interior of the country, where it's a lot colder than it is here, and it's come through beautifully. So wonderful garden rose there. The second one I wanted to talk about is Maiden's Blush. Maiden's Blush is not a very suggestive name. The other name it has is uh, Quise de Nymphemue, which I think translates to Thighs of the Passionate Nymph. This was also one of uh, Rosarian Peter Beale's favorite roses. So wonderful rose to try there. And the third thing I'll mention, uh, and I'll just put up the picture of Alba Maxima here, is that even though almost all of the rose oil in the world produced is from damask roses, they do make something called white rose oil from, presumably, Rosa Alba Maxima. And what they say is it has an extremely strong fragrance, but it's also very, very expensive, kind of a premium product there. Okay, that's everything I have on the class of Alba roses. But because I do like to save one little tidbit of information for the back end of the video, for you rose geeks who like to follow all the way through, I'm going to mention that uh, there's a term called sub rosa from Latin, meaning under the rose. And what it means is in secret or secrecy. And the connection of roses to the idea of things being secret goes back all the way to the Egyptians and carried through the Romans, where they said, if something is done sub vino, then it should be sub rosa, meaning if it's, if it's talked about when you're under the influence of wine, it should stay quiet. Uh, so for sort of their version of uh, what, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, I suppose. Uh, it carried on into the Middle Ages, and uh, so they would paint roses or hang roses in the council rooms of royalty uh, when they made decisions that wanted to be kept secret or were to be silent. And uh, so the Tudor rose that I mentioned in this video was painted in the council chamber of King Henry VIII on the roof so that everybody knew, zip your lips. Uh, it's still a modern term. If you go to the parliament in Scotland, if they say a meeting went sub rosa, it means what we in North America would say in camera or off the record. All right, thank you so much for watching. And uh, if you have any comments on any of this, please leave those below.